Now, guys, if you have questions for Dr. Rector, go ahead and um, say it loudly because we're recording. I'm recording this for posterity and for the internet. So if you have questions, it won't necessarily pick them up unless you say, hey, blah, blah, blah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is 11 o'clock, and so we're going to get started. I'm going to check my phone. It says 11 o'clock. So uh, my name is Baron Rector, and I'm an associate professor and extension range specialist in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management uh, for Texas AgriLife Extension Service, one of the sponsors of the program. Who's the other sponsor? Parks and Wildlife. Oh, yeah, Texas Parks and Wildlife. That's, uh, Jaime, you know all about them, don't you? Mm -hmm. About uh, Before he leaves, let's give our previous speaker a round of applause. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. So <laughs> today, uh, this is the Gulf Coast chapter. And uh, did you read in the agenda what I'm going to be talking about? Mm -hmm. You did? Mm -hmm. See, if you didn't, you haven't followed the instructions for being in the class. So if you didn't know what I was going to talk about, then I could talk about anything that I wanted to, and you wouldn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. So usually in our Master Naturalist handbook, there are reading materials in there that if you read them before you come to class, then you're able to ask other questions. But I've noticed at A&M with students, they don't read before they come to class. And because the new knowledge blows their hair back while they're sitting there hearing a lecture, they don't ever ask a question. So it's always good to kind of, what do I know about the topic that's coming up? Because in the Texas Master Naturalist program, one thing we know about you, the new volunteers coming into a new class, is that you come in with wives' tales, hearsay, and myths flooding your mind. And between the two agencies that sponsor the program, what we try to do from a land-grant university standpoint is to tell the truth. See, we're not coming up with homemade remedies, but we're putting out the best science-based knowledge that we have available for the era of time that we're in. So think about the prairie. Jaime has introduced you to the tall grass prairie, the coastal prairie, and uh, think about the blackland prairie that is just to the north of here, over toward San Antonio, and goes all the way to the Red River. Ninety-nine and a half percent of the tall grass prairie was plowed and put into farming. Is that good or bad? Now, think, back in 1842, when the settlers were plowing the prairie to plant their corn, their cotton, their sorghum, their watermelons, they even grew tobacco and sugar cane in that era of time, that they did what was exactly right for the time. And when you think about the industries that are on the coastal prairie around Houston and Beaumont, Port Arthur and Port Natchez, they were put there because there were no cars, there were no buses, there was no Sam's, no Walmart. And we did things because of transportation and that the boat in that era was the key to success. So when we look back, we don't chastise the people that were here before us. But as master naturalists of today, we learn how to look at the land, see the change in the land, and in our own mind, determine is the direction we're going good or bad, or should we stop what we're doing, should we pause for a moment, and then refigure out what we should be doing. So the Master Naturalist program is to bring you an understanding of the environment that you live in. When you complete the program, you will know more about our local environment than about 85% of all Texans. But at the same time, you will be an expert in absolutely nothing. <laughs> We're going to see in a, in a 48 to 60 hour course, you won't learn it all. The topic that we're looking at that your chapter spends its time on, we can spend the rest of our lifetime studying that. And so when you think about the early naturalists that came through the area, they often camped at a point. They told stories around a campfire about what they saw that night. And then the next morning, they loaded up the wagon 
and left. The one thing the early naturalists didn't write down is that spring turned into summer, that summer turned into fall, and that fall <coughs> went to winter. Most of the writings of early naturalists are at a location for one day out of the year. So the day that they were there, they may not have seen the monarch butterflies migrating through. They may not have seen a roseate <coughs> spoonbill land on a local body of water. So they wrote down what they saw, but many of the things that they wrote down are inconclusive today because they wrote it in Polish, Romanian, they wrote it in German, they wrote it in Spanish, they wrote it in Italian and, and Czech. And so we've interpreted what they wrote down, but it is not the gospel. Because see, they weren't there for 10 years to see the impact of a 7 to 10 year drought. They weren't there at that point where that piece of land received abundant rainfall for four years in a row. See, they saw it for one point in time. And so think about that early naturalist that came through here, and he said, today we saw a large herd of bison. What does the word large mean to you? If you were a mercantile operator, uh, would 24 dozen eggs be large? Uh, if you were the surveyor, would one little marker in the ground be large? If you were a military man, a lawyer, a doctor, what would the word large mean to you? And so think about that herd of bison that we know today roamed the southeastern part of the state. And uh, think about Armand Bayou Nature Center. Have y'all been there? On their website, they say they have a large herd of bison. They have three. Okay, so did the word large mean three? Did it mean 30? Did it mean 300? Did it mean 3,000, 30,000, 300,000? Or did it represent three million head of animals that roamed as a group throughout southeast Texas? Mm -hmm. And so think about those guys wrote down, they had to camp up to 14 days waiting for the herd to go by. And what do you think the ground looked like after three million head went by? It was stomped out, wasn't it? It was pulverized. Isn't it amazing that the prairie of the coastal plain could come back from having three million set of hooves go across it. And that man wrote when he got off the boat at Galveston and he went over to San Antonio that he rode in a wagon through a sea of grass. And it was boring. They got bored after the first three or four hours of the ride and the wildlife they saw were always in the distance and they never got very close to them. So who's riding would we look at, whose writing would we read to be the truth about what the original prairie looked like? The thing we know about the prairie is that it was a changing ecosystem. And so go back with me to understand change. If you go back with me to 1944, General MacArthur in World War II was called on with the Allied forces to go into the Philippine Islands, whip the Japanese and drive them off the island. The Allied forces were very successful. The Filipino people were so happy that that Japanese were gone and that they were going to have liberty and freedom and democracy that they walked around on the island doing this sign right here. And in 1944, what did that sign mean? Victory. Yeah, B for victory. Some people are old enough to remember. Some pass the stories of time down through their families. Well, I have learned in my lifetime that everything we see and how we interpret it, it changes. Because, see, the sea of knowledge is escalating today. There's more knowledge available than we use to make any known decision. So, in 1944, that meant V for victory. Well, in 1957, when I got into Cub Scout program of the Boy Scouts of America at San Angelo, Texas, I went to my first PAC meeting. The Cub Master was up on the stage of the cafeteria. We were all milling around. He held up that same sign. It was the Cub Scout sign. It meant do your best. But at the PAC meeting, what it meant was for everybody to sit down, be quiet, and for me to shut up. <laughs> the sign had changed in a mere 13 years. Well, in 1965, I got my driver's license. 
and I was running up and down the roads of San Angelo at 105 miles an hour. <laughs> and the people in the oncoming lane were all doing that through the windshield at me. Do you know what it meant? It meant, young man, if you don't slow down when you go over the hill, the highway patrolman is going to give you a ticket. <laughs> you see, I learned that through experience. <laughs> well, in 1968, when I started to college at Angelo State University at San Angelo, uh, a new group of people had moved into our community. They had hair down to their shoulders. They still live in Austin, down here on Padre Island, <laughs> over in Florida, out in California. They walked around doing identically the same sign. What did it mean? Peace. Yeah, peace, brother. How you doing today? A greeting amongst people. They knew exactly what it meant, but did you know that 42 years later in San Angelo, they still don't know what it means and they don't care? <laughs> <laughs> because in the middle of the cattle, sheep, and goat industry of Texas, who had time for long-haired environmental philosophy when the farmer and the rancher knew exactly what to do every day to make a living? So the time had changed. Well, in 1976, I got to go to Texas A&M University, the land-grant university in the state of Texas, the home of all truthful knowledge. <laughs> and at Texas A&M, I learned the true meaning of this sign. And yes, it's an Aggie meaning, but I want you to know what this really means. And I found at A&M that the true meaning of this sign is this means two. One, two. <laughs> See, we suspect that all the Aggies have learned how to count to two. Some are suspected of learning how to count to three. But see, now that you know the true meaning of this sign, what will you do with the knowledge you gain in this course? Because your neighbors don't want to hear the truth. Your neighbors won't believe what you say. And so with knowledge comes responsibility. And at the same time, with your new knowledge, you're going to be tested all the time by the people around you. So that now that you know that this means two, I want to give you a test. <laughs> if this means two, what does this mean? Nothing and see, wrong. if you live in Mex southern Mexico or Australia, it's that dirty. is a dirty, naughty, nasty <laughs> sign. <laughs> but at Texas A&M, the land-grant university oh, okay. in the state of Texas, okay. the home of all truthful knowledge, this means okay. Thursday. Yeah. Monday, oh, Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday, oh, Thursday. Oh. <laughs> See, and if you were in the Corps of Cadets training to be an officer in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and, or Marines, and your CO of your outfit held that up, you knew it was Thursday, you went and got your dirty clothes, and you all went to the laundry <laughs> together. See, how do you know that when you look outside, you're interpreting what you see on the land correctly? You weren't here in 1823. The camera wasn't invented to 1847. You have the writings of early people that were only there for one day. And no one ran a transect line on any property for vegetation and animal species in 1823. What did the early settlers do when they came in at Texarkana and on the OSR and down at Galveston and Brownsville and up at Texline and over in El Paso? Hey, look. Texas has got deep soil. It's got fresh air, clean water, abundant wildlife. Let's move to Texas and live happily ever after. See, that's what we've been doing for 187 years. But along the way, we have changed the environment of Texas through human impact. So Texas does not look the way it did in 1823. Matter of fact, not one square inch looks the way it did in 1823. Have you been to Huntsville State Park? Y'all been there? Up on Interstate 45? Well, I took a bunch of Boy Scouts over there, and a man was with his son on the nature trail. He put his arm around his son, and he said, Look, son, this is what the forest is supposed to look like. Needless to say, there's no tree in the park that is over 80 years old. And the knowledge that was lost is that in 1929, Huntsville State Park was a cotton field. And in 1932, a CCC program of the federal government came in and planted pine trees on the land. Ladies and gentlemen, the rest is the history of change. 
And see, we get there today, we think that is a virgin forest, and yet there is not one acre of virgin forest in the state of Texas. All the forests have been cut four or five times. All the grasslands of Texas have been grazed for over 200 years. And see, and it was native animals, or today it's the domesticated animals that we have. So, to bring you enlightenment uh, about this, I want to give you a handout that uh, was put together in a book called The Ecosystems of the World. And the chapter I'm giving you is on natural grasslands. And inside, the article that I have photocopied for you is on the coastal prairie. And if you learn everything that's in this document, you will have gotten about a three-hour course on the coastal prairie at the college level. And there are words in there that you'll have to look up. I don't know what all the words in this article mean. But I do want to, uh, when you get a copy, turn to the back of the first page and look at this beginning of the article with me. Starting over in the second paragraph of the right-hand column. And look at what it says. The grasslands are potentially mid to tall grass prairies, but the many rivers and streams that cross the region, as well as several woody vegetation contacts, provide for a variety of woody species as potential invaders. What does that mean? To invade something, it means that something changes, allowing something that wasn't there to move in. Encroachment of woody species was discouraged, now I'm on page 270, under pristine conditions by the combination of things that Jaime told you about, adaptive conditions, meaning the, the clay, shrink, swell, poorly drained soils of the coastal prairie, the periodic fires, and the absence of sustained overgrazing. See, with the onset of overgrazing by livestock and elimination of fires, Woody vegetation increased in abundance. Prosopis glandulosa and Quercus virginiana, the mesquite and the live oak were, however, almost certainly components of the upland parts of the region, even prior to European settlement. Well, how many of you would have said that the mesquite in Texas is an invader, not native to Texas, brought in from cattle drives from Central America and Mexico? Let's look at scientific facts. The first specimen of hunting mesquite was collected in 1832 south of the Canadian River in the Panhandle of Texas, only nine years after we began settlement of the state by Europeans. The largest stand of mesquite ever found in Texas prior to 1850 was found 30 miles south of Fort Worth, Texas. Now we'll look at the rat midden research in West Texas. When we go into a rat's midden, all the layers of its excrement, its food, the pollen out of the air that have been put there for thousands of years, what we find is the mesquite has been in Texas, through carbon dating of the pollen, a mere 10,000 years. See, what is the truth? And so, man, when he writes an article, he takes the known facts of the day and puts them down. But as we learn about the earth and we learn about where we live, will it not change? And how we perceive what we see will change. Look in the next paragraph. Abundant native ungulate populations existed by the time of settlement by Europeans. And by the early 1800s, populations of feral cattle and horses were already large. The first scientific observers saw the results of over 100 years of overgrazing, see, by the time that we got here. Consequently, they misinterpreted the potential vegetation of the area. Later investigations of remnant grasslands and well-managed ranches suggested that the coastal prairie be identified as the Schizacrium scoparium little blue stem and the Sorgastrum nutans association. But is that true of the whole area? See, when you go and look at this map, look at where the coastal prairie is. And the area over here around Beaumont, we see in, in, in uh, uh, Lake Charles, 
receive around 1,450 millimeters of rainfall a year. And down at the bottom here at Corpus Christi, they get half that much rain. Well, Jaime told you that the amount of water present on the prairie helped give rise to what grew here. The kinds of soils, where our weather comes from, if it's off of the Gulf, if it comes from the Pacific, if it's a blue norther that comes from the Arctic and from Canada. All those things had impact. And so what we find is in our 115 years worth of weather data, we have not recorded the coldest day, the hottest day, the longest drought, or the most abundant rainfall that will occur in the area. We haven't been here long enough to see the range of normality. What is normal in the state? You remember in 2005, Dallas, Texas set a record for the hottest day ever recorded? And the, the weatherman that night said, hey, wh when you've been this hot, when you've set a record, you've been that hot before. Because can you tell the difference between 106 and 107 degrees? I'm going to be in the house with the air conditioner. You see? And so it was hot. So the extremes of the weather have not been seen. The activity of natural processes in the ecosystem that we live in, we haven't seen it all in the lifetime that we have. But when we look back in history, we see the things that have changed. So if this is the past and this is the present, I can draw a line from the past to the present. But the future out here, if everything stays the same, I can predict the future. But what we do today in the present creates tomorrow. And so what we do today, the decisions that we make as the stewards of the creation will determine the angle of what the future is going to be like. So even though we can't make the prairie out here that was farmed come back into tall grass by clicking our fingers, we start things that initiate that process because man... When he first got here, 90% of all the early settlers prior to 1850 in Texas had farming as their background. They farmed the land that, to do that to make money. And then as we headed toward the, civil, the war between the states, farming became less profitable. Man started looking at the livestock that were roaming the prairie. And the first herding of livestock to go to a trailhead where a, a railroad came to ship the animals back to the east. That occurred in 1859 up in Palo Pinto County, and 2,300 animals were herded to Indiana because Abilene, Kansas, had not been, the railroad had not got there yet. So they had to go all the way to Indiana to sell the animals. Well, people believe by John Wayne movies that we've been herding animals since the beginning of time in Texas. The first herding of animals was from East Texas to Central Texas, and when the water of Central Texas played out, the animals were moved back to the Trinity River and the Sabine River where permanent waters could be found. Because see, in that period of time, we had no windmills. Windmill didn't come out until the 1883-84 period. There were no bulldozers, there were no ponds, and there were no lakes. The only true lake in Texas is what? Yeah, Lake Caddo. Everything else has been built by humans. And so then, after the war, we began the tradition of what ranching is like today. But by the turn of the century, going into 1900, we'd gone through an extreme drought in the 1883 period where 10 million head of cattle died in Texas, not because of the lack of grass, but because of no water. See, they dehydrated and died. And so when the windmill came along, then farming picked back up because it became profitable again. And then by the end of World War II, farming started to decline. And now we've been in the period of livestock production on the land again. So we've already gone through farming twice and livestock twice. And what is it today? Both of them are dying in Texas. It's now ecotourism. See, plant blue bonnets to get the people from Arkansas to come down here and spend their tourist dollars. <laughs> but where does any of that bring health to the environment that we live in? See, what does that do? And so 
you, I want you to read this because the geology is great and the things that the Fred Smines and Dave Diamond and Wayne Henselk have put together in, in this paper are very valuable to how we should interpret what we see today. Now, I want to <coughs> give you a copy of give you a copy of the paper to uh, pass around that came out in 1999. See, what I'm trying to do here yes. is I'm trying to show you the truth about the land. Remove the wives' tales on why you came into this course. And so, in this article on the terrestrial ecoregions of North America, I have photocopied the section in here on the western Gulf Coastal Prairie. And these were our best scientists of the time. And I, I read this when you get home. Don't try to read it here. Makes good bathroom reading material. <laughs> but turn to the back of the first page and look at this column on conservation status. And it says, Habitat Loss and Degradation. As already mentioned, less than 1% of the western Gulf coastal grasslands remains in near pristine condition. Less than 1%. Hasn't it all changed due to man, our industry, our urbanization, our farming, our ranching, our planting cute trees around the homestead in 1880 that now have escaped out on the land called Chinese Tallow Tree, the China Berry, the Pyracantha, the Red Tip Photemia, the, the Wax Leaf Ligustrum, the Chinese and Japanese Privet Hedges, Aren't they becoming abundant because they reproduce on the land? So look at what he says. Conversion to agricultural production has caused the greatest loss, fragmentation of remaining habitat via subdividing large tracts into more marketable ranchettes leads to other degrading factors such as overgrazing, exotic plant expansion, lack of fires and natural or prescribed process, and modification of local hydrological features by means of land level. Did not y'all see the water running down the edge of the road as you drove in here? We're getting rid of the water off of the land as fast as we can. What would be normal here on this prairie? All winter so we'd be dead. standing in six inches of water. See, that would be normal. Well, what does man want to do with the land? Yeah, he wants to get rid of the water. So man is literally drying up Texas. He's taking and converting a wetland prairie into a desert of West Texas so that man can do what man wants to do here. See, our businesses, our schools. And so, we'll, and we'll talk about this more. Look in the second paragraph. Coastal wetlands are less suited in most cases for high-density development and agricultural conversion. However, Channelization projects with all their associated damage to overland sheet flow and hydrological function continue to impact this portion of the western Gulf Coastal grassland. Subsidence, erosion, and loss of emergent wetlands are serious problems that will continue. See, and so the rest is described in here for you to look at. Well, with those descriptions, they didn't describe the place that you own or manage. And so, what did the 1952 description of the area look like? And I'm going to give you a paper that Frank Gould and others wrote with the Texas Agricultural Experiment Station on what the coastal prairie and marshes really look like. But it's only two pages. To, to describe the Katy Prairie, I could write a book this big. So note that man does everything quick. He does it short. He wants it simple. He doesn't want to be bothered with too much knowledge. And hopefully, through this class, your mind will be altered, changed, and your brain will be filled up. Because, see, it takes knowledge and understanding. See, there's, there's a famous proverb in the Bible that says, knowledge and understanding are worth more than all the gold and silver on the earth. And so, what is it that we're trying to achieve? What do we want to know? about the environment that we have here today. So, let's begin by looking at the father of wildlife management. He was not God. He was not the Savior. He was a man that looked, learned how to look at the land. And he said in 1933, We of the industrial age boast of our control over nature. 
There is no force in earth or sky which we will not shortly harness to build a good life for ourselves. But see, in 1933, he challenged the American public and he said, but what is the good life? Is that three Porsches in the garage or is that clean air and clean water? And so he said, we stand guard over works of eons that are stolen from under our noses, gain can be restored by creative use of the same tools which have heretofore destroyed it, the axe, the plow, the cow, the fire, and the gun. And in 2010, there are no new tools. All the tools that we have in our land management mimic those five things. Even the hydro axe, the CEPI, that was used at, to get rid of the Chinese talent trees at Armand Bayou Nature Center. It's still only doing the same thing that the axe did. And when I spray a chemical on it, it only does the same thing that the axe does. We're killing the plant. See, so look at the change when we go to 1936 in a letter from the Secretary of Agriculture to a Senate committee on the health of the western rangeland. And in 1936, we were in the same group with California, Washington, uh, Colorado, and New Mexico. He said, the private owner's responsibility for the stewardship of land is a concept conspicuous largely by its absence in the United States. 1936. He said man didn't care about what he was doing then either and did not see any negative repercussions to man's <clears throat> society building as it is done. When did the Dust Bowl begin? When we first got here in 1823. We started it then. Yes. And so the greatest change in the land of Texas occurred prior to 1890. See, we're only living in the land that was changed two centuries ago. The damage to the land is not being done today at the rate it was being done up to 1885. Yeah, it was already done. And we, we have classic examples uh, that we have the normal soil loss through erosion <clears throat> per year on the land in Texas is 700 pounds to the acre. That would be the normal soil leaving an acre of land. Well, we have a lot of places that don't lose but 70 pounds of soil now because why? There is no soil left to lose. See, think about that. The change has already been done prior to our parents. See, back in our grandparents' era is when the greatest damage to the land ecosystem was done in the state. Not, not what we're, we're at, actually what we're doing today. But ownership has been regarded as carrying the right of unrestricted use even though it meant destruction and even though the evil consequences of destruction did not stop with the owner but were extended to the public <coughs> and to prosperity. Think about they lowered the speed limit in Harris County and all the uh, surrounding counties from 70 to 55 in 2001. I drove the second day the new signs went up. They didn't tell us they were doing it. But when I drove, I was driving 59 and a half miles an hour so I wouldn't get a ticket. But the people of Houston were passing me at 85 miles an hour. If you stop them and ask them why they were breaking the law, they said, oh, I'm late to work. I'm late to piano. I'm late to pick up the kids. I'm late, late, late. You see, man makes up time by breaking the law. But ladies and gentlemen, what gave them the right to break the law? See, laws are made to help to guide man into doing the right thing. Well, they were doing it, TCEQ put the law in because we were not going to get our federal highway monies because our air quality in the area does not meet EPA standards. So they said if we slow all those cars down, the quality of the air will improve and we'll get our federal money. Twelve months later, a new study on how much carbon <coughs> is put out by all the cars on the earth came out. And they found out that the total emissions of carbon into the air from all motorized vehicles is only 4% of the daily load emitted into the air. They compromised and upped the speed limit back to 65. See, but they never told you that. But that's exactly why and what happened. New research came out that if we stopped all vehicles from driving today, all combustible motors today, there would not be any change in the CO2 in the air for the next 100 years. See, what, what's the greatest source of CO2 on a daily basis emitted into the atmosphere of the earth? 
volcanoes. And I don't think you're controlling or have any control over any of those. So, he said, basic to the restoration and conservation of the range resource, meaning the grassland, is the recognition of entirely different philosophy. That ownership carries with it the obligation and responsibility for preservation which the owner owes to himself, to his descendants, and to the public. In 1936, the word preservation did not mean build a fence around it and keep all humans on. It meant preserve the natural processes of the land. Collection of sunlight through photosynthesis, that decomposition that Jaime was talking about, that birth and death occur. That pollination is rampant. That seed distribution by, by uh, cockle burrs and fruit hanging on the fur of animals, that that continue. Because, see, those are the things that are normal and natural. But man's trying to bring a halt to those. So think about the guy that after this class, he went home and looked at his backyard and he said, man, it's St. Augustine, it's Bermuda grass, they're all from foreign countries. The red tip photemia, the, the pyracantha bushes, those uh, um, um, Chinese privet hedges. He went into his backyard and killed everything. And he planted it back to native plants. In the third year, everything was up and flowering. He was sitting under the umbrella on the back porch drinking his coffee at seven. And at that moment in time, a black bear walked into his backyard. <laughs> See, that would be the epitome of success. <laughs> bringing one of the top carnivores, predators of the area back. <laughs> what would you be doing? My heart would be going like this. My feet would be going like this. And I'd be in the house calling the animal damage control to come pick the bear up. <laughs> See, do, are you sure you want a land that was like our ancestors found? See, today, in town, a different ecosystem, there are no wolves and no bears. There are no alligators in downtown. Because, see, anything that ate our children, we got rid of it. See, are you sure you want to put it back the way it was? See, then it would be a wild land. So, he would, this was pretty enlightening, that man has a responsibility for stewardship of the land. That's a Judeo-Christian belief system. That in Genesis, God gave man <coughs> dominion over the earth. He didn't say change the earth. He said take care of the earth so that it will continue for eons of time. But see, what leads man today? That's right. The green Greed. money. The government isn't passing bills to save the land and our environment. They're passing bills that help spread the money. That's, right. That's all that you see today in the in the environment that we live. Well, let's look in 1970. E.J. Dijksterhuis was the Mercer Award winner in 1948 in the Ecological Society of America. And he wrote a book in 1970, A Philosophy on Man's Role in the Ecosystem. The, the word ecosystem didn't make it to Texas till 1985. But we had an ecosystem science department at the University of Florida in 1968. See, we're always behind in Texas. Because until somebody else proves it works, we ain't going to do it. The Master Gardener program was around for 15 years before it was even started in Texas. We, we kind of wait. He said, we cannot return to nature's way. We will never fit in an ecosystem as primitive man once did. Did any of you grub up tubers and worms this morning for breakfast? No. You're dependent on HEB, affiliated foods, Super S, apple tree, to bring you all the food you need. He said, nor can we conquer nature because natural laws are not subject to repeal. What does that mean? It means you can't click your fingers and turn spring into summer. You can't stop a snowstorm. You can't stop a hurricane. You cannot stop an earthquake. Because, see, you are not in charge. But the natural system is. And it was set into play long before we ever got here. And so in this era of time, we're only learning about how that natural system works with people like the Katy Prairie Foundation that have an interest in preserving the land that helps make clean air and clean water. 
See, and then some government entities are in that too. He said, we know that when we cause imbalances in nature in one facet of an ecosystem, we must compensate in another facet. He concluded by saying, we must work to restoring balances. Well, ladies and gentlemen, look under this building. Plants used to grow here. Sex used to occur here. <laughs> Bees roamed the area. Snakes crawled through. The rain infiltrated into the soil when it hit the ground here. None of that happens anymore. Where did the owners compensate? Oh, well, let's set this acre over here aside so we can build on this acre of the coastal prairie. The law has allowed us to kill and destroy 50% of all the wetlands in Texas. We are the leading state in the destruction of wetlands. Half of them are gone. See, So where did we compensate? When I look at the ecosystem, it is the entire earth. See, it's not just one small piece of land. Were you here in 1988 when the smoke of burning sugar cane came through here from Mexico City? See, we are a global ecosystem. We must work to restoring the balances of where water goes, how, how plants grow, how we use the land. It has an impact on everything that we do today. So, there's our ecosystem. But man made up that word. And so, and when I think about ecology, ecos, the Latin and Greek word, that means house. And eneology <coughs> is the study of. So ecology is the study of the house. Well, when I look at the ecosystem, I look at everything that's going on in that house and how it relates to the environment around it. Because, see, what I do on my land impacts my neighbor. What my neighbor does has an impact on me. All these things are interrelated, and that's why today we're at the ecosystem level. So we are guided in what we do on the land through the principles of ecology, the principles of the study of the house. And principle number one says the plant or forage, the grazing animal or harvester, and the intrinsic value of a healthy ecosystem needs to be looked at together, not separately. Well, how does man break that principle? He calls on Texas Parks and Wildlife to help him move Muy Grande genetic deer in, build a high fence, and spend a bunch of money to build one animal at the expense of 450 other species of wildlife. That is breaking that. I'm looking at one thing. I'm not looking at it all together. But see, that generates money if I get a Cajun or someone from North Carolina to pay me $15,000 to hunt that Muy Grande deer. See, money is leading the way. Principle number two says, however, change is normal. The land manager should understand the change and know it has an influence on all of his management decisions. Well, here where we live, the wise man said, in Texas, we're always in a drought with infrequent floods. See, until we learn how to live with that, we cannot successfully manage this part of the ecosystem. See, y'all remember praying for rain in 1999? Mm. Praying for rain in 2000? Praying for rain in 2001? Oh, God, just let it rain and I'll live happily ever after. <laughs> See, the thing is, you already get the right amount of rain. No more and no less. If we got the rain you prayed for, this area of Texas would look like the swamps of southern Louisiana. See, we already get the right amount. The weathermen say that on precipitation and temperature, this area of the state has not changed one iota in the last 500 years. Change is slow. So, he, principle number three says, for every action, there are multiple reactions which can occur. Well, sir, 